Welcome and welcome back, everybody, to the Oak Creek Grognard Show. It is Thursday, May 27th, 2021, 10 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We are continuing with our videos on spell explanations. We left off just before diving into the first edition advanced dungeons and dragons dungeon master's guide spell explanation section on magic user spells so that's where we're going to start today and we will do that in the usual way looking inside the dmg itself as we often do. I'm going to pop this up over here. There we go. In fact, it starts with Charm Person. That's a fun one. That one doesn't require any explanation, right? There's never any confusion over how Charm Person works, except every time. It's, one's, it's definitely one that gets interpreted a lot of different ways, and more power to you if you want to interpret it any way you like for your own game that's absolutely your call the uh powers that be gary and his kin his ilk those that played with gary in the early days and maybe a few outside because at this point you know we're a few years into the game and people are going to conventions and people are talking sending in letters and saying hey does this work this way hey i think it should work that way and so on and so forth so when it came to charm person there were probably being a first level spell and even people that had only played a short period of time if they had any magic users they probably ran into some questions about charm person and one of the things it says here is attacks causing damage upon the subject person will cause a saving throw bonus of plus one per hit point of damage sustained in the round that the charm is... There we go. Sorry about that. A little sneeze there. Um, so what do we got going on here? <laughs> so magic user spells, first level spells, charm person, attacks causing damage upon the subject will cause a saving throw bonus of plus one per hit point of damage sustained in the round that the charm is cast. So, that is to say... If somebody attacks <laughs> Sarah's suggestion is is it because you find the person you were attacking so charming they get a bonus from your hesitation to hit them uh, well, let me read this again attacks causing damage upon the subject person that is the person that the charm is being cast on will cause the saving throw bonus of plus one per hit point of damage sustained in the round that the charm is cast. So, if there's an attack in the same round the charm is being cast on someone, then the person being charmed gets plus one per hit point of damage that they sustain against the charm that is being cast on them. So, if somebody doesn't realize you're casting the charm that's in your group let's say and they also intend and plan and do actually attack that person and hit and do damage let's say they somebody sticks a dagger in the person being charmed and it does two points of damage then they get plus two on the saving throw that they're making against that charm so the fact that they're being attacked and damaged is uh detrimental to the charm taking effect 
that's pretty straightforward. I think uh, you got to remember that Charm Person also will not turn somebody into your uh, minion as far as attacking their own other friends. So you can't turn somebody against their party. Um, if somebody in your group gets charmed, they're not going to turn and attack you. That would go against their nature. They might uh, hem and haw and whatever, but they're not actually going to attack. Uh, there are higher level spells, Dominate for instance, that can uh, cause that sort of uh, inner party you know, turn friends against friends. So watch for those spells. Watch out using charm in a way that makes it more powerful than intended. Reread it a few times uh, and see what you think. And uh, feel free to drop me a line. Comprehend languages. The reverse, confused languages, can be cast upon a scroll to make it unreadable. But a second comprehend languages spell will then succeed. So, there's a nifty little use for using the reverse of a spell, confused languages. If you see somebody about to read a scroll, you can get that spell off in time. Then you can uh, make it unreadable, perhaps uh, preventing somebody from casting a nasty spell against you. Detect magic. This spell detects the intensity of magic, dim, faint, moderate, strong, very strong, intense. And there is a 10% chance per level of the caster of that type, abjuration, alteration, etc., of the caster that the type, whatever type it is, can be found as well. Although, if a dual type the detection percentage applies to both and must be rolled for separately. So, lots of extra information can be gained from a detect magic if you're using it under certain conditions. It may be that finding out that there's a magical trap is important. Uh, you can think of dim, faint, moderate, strong, very strong, intense as levels of magic. So if somebody has cast a first level hold portal on a door, you can find out that it's fairly dim, maybe faint. I don't know. Dim is the lowest and first level is the lowest. So why not link them up, say first and second, let's dim. Maybe wizard lock should be faint, a little higher. Maybe some trap that has explosive ruins is also uh, fairly low, whereas triggering a fireball effect, for instance, might be much higher or stronger. Also good to be able to know the type, because if we can know the type, then we can link it up with a number of spells and figure out what type of magic it is and what might be on it and how dangerous it might be. If it's an illusion, it's good to figure that out, for instance. Next one, enlarge. All garments and equipment worn by a subject of the spell should be considered to automatically drop off if held by straps or fasteners, otherwise to split away during growth. So it is not possible to squeeze someone to death in their armor by means of an enlarge. Material components possessed will not change size. Coats of mail, however, will be ruined if growth occurs well worn. Note that you can opt to make the target wearing objects Note that you can opt to make a target wearing objects an impossible task for an enlarged spell unless the character is actually touched so as to distinguish the creature from the objects. So DM's call on that one, if you want to say, 
that the person casting the spell has to actually touch that person and not just their armor or whatever. On the other hand, uh, maybe enlarging or invertly um, making small the uh, armor of someone so that it splits apart and becomes useless helps out a great deal. George jumped in and said, I suspect the spell cast years ago could lose intensity over time. Yeah, that's a real good point, George. Um, maybe time as a way of making magic fade. And I guess you would have to also make a decision whether fading magic to... Um, to how strong the actual effect is. So you could, as a DM, determine that in your campaigns that over time a hold portal or rather a uh, wizard lock on a door is less powerful and then might be able to be broken by lesser means um, to spell magic against certain Older spells, maybe, has a better percentage of dispelling them. Some things to consider for your own campaign. And undoubtedly, it could be helpful information to know, if you're exploring a tomb, whether a spell is old or whether it was newly cast, so that you know whether someone else has been in that tomb prior to you getting there in a recent period of time erase the spell might be useful against glyphs of warding okay he says might so gary's not uh saying it's required for a dm to think of it that way but why not right any uh any spell that leaves a written remnant behind why not be able to use a magical form of erase? Sure, you can't just rub a glyph of warding off the wall and ruin it. But erasing it magically is a thing, all right? Find familiar. If the magic user opts to send away a familiar, he or she may never again find another until the former is killed or dies, purposefully killing or causing to be killed a familiar or former familiar is most likely to find great disfavor with the gods. Assuming, of course, that this pertains to the magic user and his or her associated familiar. Note that spell duration concerns the finding of the familiar. Once it is found, the familiar will serve until killed to determine animal availability, see the fourth level druid spell, Animal Summoning One. So that's a good uh, tip for how to uh, sort through that. You do have a table that tells you the different familiars that can be found, but perhaps they're just not available in the area where you are. So maybe the spell doesn't always work. Or perhaps you can go to a specific area where certain types of animals are known to abound so that you can increase the likelihood that you'll find one type of familiar rather than another. Not really a bad idea. Great McLean comic there. They're holding his cat hostage. The wizard is being held at bay. We'll continue with first level spells for magic user. The DMG explanations light. This spell can effectively blind an opponent as noted under the commentary on the clerical spell of the same name, which was mentioned a little earlier in this section. So you can use light to block someone's vision. They get a saving throw, though, is basically the gist of it. Message, this is not a tongue spell. The speech will be as normal for the spellcaster. Just to say you can send a message, but 
the person receiving it needs to speak the same language as you or it's going to be useless protection from evil the spell prevents attacks which employ parts of the body of affected creatures cleric spell of the same name so yeah check the cleric section on some of the details of how that works sleep unless a single creature is designated as a target of sleep of the sleep spell in a mixed group the sleep spell will first affect the lowest level hit dice targets so if you realize there is one creature that is higher level and you want to key on them first Hmm. Now, this is interesting. Unless a single creature is designated as a target, does this suggest that you can target a second level creature? Let's say you're not saying any second level creatures, you're saying that specific one right there is who I'm targeting, and it won't affect anybody else? It seems to be saying that. This I was unaware of. My assumption was that you could target one and it would spread out to others who are there as well this seems to suggest you could target a single creature in a group and it either works or it doesn't but it doesn't affect anybody else in the area which is interesting I guess it could be read either way but this seems to suggest you can be a little more fiddly with who you're targeting and I like that. I think thinking, uh, hmm, let's see. I think going forward, that's what I will do. So there you go. Uh, Tensor's Floating Disc. Ernie's famous spell, which he created in Gary's game so that he could make sure he got every last copper out of the dungeon. The caster cannot ride on the disc. The disc always follows the magic user. Unseen Servant, one of my favorites. The created force has no shape, so it cannot be clothed. Must have come up in a game for somebody to do that. Right. Ink for use with this spell is only 10% likely to be located at any given apothecary slash alchemist in a town or double that for a city ink will come in a flask which will be sufficient to inscribe two to four spells the cost will be 200 to 500 gold pieces you should devise whatever formula for manufacture of this substance you desire dm Icor of Slithering Tracker, Octopus Ink, and Powdered Gems are a fair place to start from. No need for the word from on the end of that gear. Come on. He knows better. Nevertheless, it's a casual style of conversation sprinkled with High Guy Gaxian. So there you go. Anyway, make it an unusual kind of... Uh, Maybe a certain plant that you've created for your game setting that is uh, particular to making the kind of ink that works in creating scrolls and the such. So, well, come up with something, something uh, rare or unique, and that way, uh, that way it explains its uh, cost as well as its uh, rarity. Moving on into second level spells. Where are we at? 19 in? Okay. We can knock off a few more here. Detect evil. The magic detects only the intensity of the evil. Again, check the cleric spell of the same name for that information. Invisibility. See the invisibility section under the adventure. Yeah, that's something we should spend some time with too. As, as one of those uh, rarefied rules... Uh, adjudicating uh, 
conundrums that DMs often face. So we will look at that another time rather than shift gears now. But it is absolutely the reason that a lot of old school players always want to carry a small bag of flour or dust with them so that they can find a way to see invisible objects when they can and uh, locate objects see the clerk spell the same name for our complete commentary rope trick rope trick those climbing the rope and gaining the safety of the extra dimensional space are able to see out of it clearly as if they were observing through a window of about three foot width by five foot height those outside cannot see in yes please what is the intensity of evil inquiring minds wants to know say sarah yeah just backing that up for a second detect evil So, that intensity is meant to uh, be on the order of, is it uh, low level like a skeleton's evil or a race evil or a higher like a, a demon or a devil, uh, maybe an evil high priest, that sort of thing. So you get that. You won't know whether it's lawful evil or chaotic evil. You won't know whether it is the evil of a demon or the evil of a devil specifically. But whether it's powerful or whether it's fairly weak. Which is a, a good gauge to have when determining whether or not you should run away. Which is an option too few people take advantage of leads to more character death in first edition D&D &D and earlier than uh, most anything else is the instinct the uh, quelling of the instinct to run when one should run stinking cloud a gust of wind spell will blow this away in one round after contact if it is cast in a place where there is considerable air movement the stinking cloud will move in the direction of the air current at uh, one to six inches per round that's 10 to 60 feet depending on airspeed for each 10 feet of such movement shorten its duration by one round so the movement actually does help dissipate the stinking cloud as well web the spell is cast without two firm anchoring places the webs collapse and entangle themselves effectively negating the spell so I guess I would give some leeway here as a DM as to what you're calling anchoring places because can't you indeed call the floor and the top of someone's head two anchoring places thus creating a huge blob of webs that covers the person and sticks them to that place in the floor I think uh, I think it's fair to be uh, pretty lenient with uh, the parameters of what you're anchoring it to depending on how much you want to catch in it so that uh, out in the open air just dropping it on a field of people as if it were a net is not quite how the spell works because it's elasticity is trying to make it snap on in on itself and its stickiness once it does make it makes it so that it doesn't expand further again so if you think about it that way and describe it that way I think you can limit its use without having it anchored on say two two walls of a corridor so think about it that way wizard lock the caster can always pass through his or her own 
wizard locked portal freely which is to say a caster can open and close a wizard locked door others can pass through if the wizard is there to open that door for them and once they close it again it remains wizard locked so they cannot come out without come back through the door without the help of that wizard so keep that in mind and I think that covers up to third level so I think what we will do is hold off on that until next week and that's where we'll pick it up good questions today thank you for uh, chiming in in the chat with those feel free to ask more next week when we get back into the third level stuff and let us say this if you are checking this out on twitch on monday and thursday at 10 a.m central it's about a half hour show so do sit in be sure to follow the channel and chime in on the chat got any questions ask them happy to answer them provided we have time and i know the answers i'll tell you if i don't also to say if you're catching up with this on youtube where we archive it usually within an hour after the show airs then please do subscribe and click the little bell to get notifications of when new shows are uploaded feel free to leave comments if you have some constructive criticism or want to join the conversation and please by all means give a thumbs up to any videos you watch and or enjoy this has been the okay grognard show from beautiful lake geneva wisconsin Bye-bye. Uh,